welcome again to our uh, our midweek Bible study. This uh, this time we're in our 14th session from the book of 1 Corinthians, and again we're in chapter 15. This is our third session here in chapter 15. It's been a good uh, a good chapter for us because there's a lot of meat uh, in the Word of God in chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. But before we begin, let's uh, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do thank you for the opportunity again to study your word together here online. And Lord, we ask you to come into this uh, this Bible study and lead us and guide us through it. Lord, we remember our church members that are uh, still dealing with physical illness. Lord, we ask you to remember Brother Bobby, who's uh, at this time still in the hospital. Lord, I understand there's been some improvement there. And we're uh, prayerful that uh, Brother Bobby will get to come home soon. Lord, we just uh, watch over him and restore him to full health. Lord, remember Nellie. We're grateful for the fact that our uh, COVID tests keep coming back uh, negative, and we uh, ask you to continue to let that be the case, Lord, that it not enter into her body. Uh, Lord, we ask you to uh, uh, remember our uh, our brother Dave Dothed and uh, his wife Diane as he continues to struggle with his um, uh, COPD. Uh, Lord, just uh, be with Bob and Cheryl. Uh, we're great, uh, grateful for the answered prayer that it seems to be that they're uh, uh, feeling somewhat better, so Lord, we are grateful for that. Uh, Lord, be with uh, Shirley, Shirley Falk. Uh, she's been struggling with some back issues, Lord, and we ask you to uh, take that pain away from her, or uh, Lord, at least provide a, uh, a reasonable way of treating it, Lord, that um, she won't have to suffer with that uh, pain in her back, Lord. And there's also been various sicknesses in her family, so we ask you to uh, just remember her family and those that are around her. Uh, Lord, we again mostly just uh, thank you for the opportunity to come together and study your word and ask you to lead us and guide us through this study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, last time uh, Paul began a, a discussion in chapter 15 regarding the resurrection of believers. Uh, he began uh, uh, with a, a discussion of Jesus' resurrection and then he went to uh, a series of proofs that we too, like Jesus, will be uh, raised from the dead. Now, as he moves forward with this, Paul is anticipating uh, uh, the questions that will come at him regarding the resurrection of the dead. Uh, so he he knows one of the questions, he's anticipated it, and that question is, in what kind of body will, be, will we be raised? Uh, and, and a good question, I think. Um, so, in verse uh, 35, the word says, but uh, Paul answering his own question or, or, or regarding the question, he says, but uh, some will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Now, it appears this question was asked of Paul in a, in a kind of a mocking tone. There, there, there seems to have been a, a good many people there in Corinth who were uh, denying uh, the bodily resurrection of the dead. They were uh, under the influence of the early Gnostics and maybe even uh, uh, some of the Sadducees that had converted, uh, that had uh, not believed in, in the resurrection uh, even before Christ. So uh, for whatever reason in Corinth, they were struggling with the idea that people can be raised from the dead. And, and now they're saying, all right, Paul, you've gone through all of this trouble uh, to uh, lay out your argument that people will be raised from the dead. Uh, uh, but that argument still isn't holding water with us. Uh, and uh, uh, they're saying, but but just suppose, let's let's say uh, for uh, on a hypothetical basis, let's just say if somebody could be raised from the dead, what, uh, what kind of body are they going to be raised in? What's that resurrection body going to be like? I, I think they were being somewhat sarcastic in how they were asking Paul this question. Uh, I don't really believe they were asking out of true interest in the resurrection from the dead, but uh, Paul goes on to answer the question. Uh, he answers in verses 36 through 38 when he writes, Foolish one, uh, what you sow is not made alive unless it dies, and what you sow, uh, you do not sow that body uh, that shall be, but mere grain, perhaps wheat or some, uh, some other grain, but God. It gives it a body as he pleases, and each seed is, it, uh, is its own body. Paul, uh, Paul understands, uh, I think, the sarcastic nature of the questioning here, and he, he calls these people foolish for even asking the question, a foolish one. Uh, but uh, 
uh, but he starts by giving them uh, an illustration uh, and he brings them an illustration from nature. He's talking here about a seed, uh, a common a common seed. He says, look, if you sow a seed in, it, in the ground, it, it won't sprout into in the new life until that seed uh, decomposes, until that seed uh, uh, ceases to be a seed. He says that uh, the, there won't be a new plant born until that seed dies. Um, life comes from what is dead. He's saying uh, new, new life springs up from uh, a dead seed. And when that uh, when that seed dies and it sprouts into a new plant, uh, the plant uh, doesn't have the same kind of body the seed had when it went into the ground. It, it doesn't look like uh, that seed that died. Uh, when you plant a seed, and he, he uses wheat as an example, he says wheat or some other uh, other uh, grain, wheat or corn, let's say, if it sprouts, and uh, then God gives that plant a, a body as God as it pleases God. Um, every every seed produces a different kind of a body. It's a, a different kind of plant for every seed that's sown. If God, uh, Paul is saying, if God can give. A resurrection body to a, a dead seed, he can certainly uh, provide a, a resurrection body for you when you die. Paul goes on in verse 39 uh, to write, all, all flesh is not the same flesh, uh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of animals, another of fish, and another of birds. There are also celestial bodies and terrestrial bodies, but uh, the glory of the celestial is one, the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is a, a one glory for the sun, another glory for the moon, another glory for the stars. Uh, for one star uh, differs from another star in glory. Uh, so also the resurrection of the dead. Uh, Paul's point in, in all of that is that uh, by God's design, there are many different kinds of, of bodies. And each of those bodies are, are, are designed to live uh, and function under very different conditions. Uh, uh, not all bodies are the same uh, in this present life. Uh, humans, are, humans are certainly different uh, than animals in their physical body, and animals are different from fish, and fish are different from birds. Uh, all of these animals and uh, fish and birds, animals of humans, were all of a different physical nature. Each of God's created beings uh, has a body that God designed uh, that suited uh, uh, for that uh, that creation's needs, uh, that its existence, even even celestial bodies in heaven, uh, he says, are different than the terrestrial bodies here on earth. He mentions uh, 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 celestial bodies like the sun and the uh, the moon and the stars. He says all of them are different from each other, and then even each star is uh, is different from any other star. No two stars are really alike. Uh, so he says each of those bodies are different. Uh, and they all exist in a different plane of existence. So God uh, can certainly design a body uh, that is perfect for you uh, to, uh, uh, after death, to live in the resurrection. It goes on in verses 42 to 44 to write that the body is sown in corruption. It is raised in, in corruption. It is sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's uh, sown in weakness. It's raised in power. It's sown a natural body it's raised a spiritual body there's a, a natural body and there is a spiritual body of paul's uh, saying there that uh, our our resurrection bodies are going to be uh, different uh, uh, than the natural bodies that we have now these physical bodies he, he, all of this is parallel to what paul has written before in the in the book of philippians where he says there'll be no more uh, sickness no more pain no more death uh, uh, so our, uh, the uh, the incorruptible uh, uh, will become uh, our new form, our new our new state. We'll no longer have to worry about death. Uh, he goes on to say that there'll be no more shame uh, in heaven. There'll be no more sin because our dishonorable body's been turned into an honorable body. There'll uh, there'll be no more weakness in regard to temptation. We won't uh, uh, we won't be tempted anymore and fall into sin. Uh, so he, he says that uh, we will we won't be tied down by the uh, the limits of our natural body anymore. We'll have a spiritual body instead of a natural one, so we won't be uh, uh, relegated to the uh, the laws of nature, the laws of time and space. We'll be able to overcome that. Our our resurrection body, he says, will be a spiritual body 
rather than an actual one. He goes on to give us a few more details in, uh, in verse 45. He says, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last uh, Adam uh, became a life-giving spirit. However, the, the spiritual is not first, but the natural. And afterward, the, the spiritual, the, uh, the first man was uh, of the earth. Uh, made of the dust, uh, the second man is uh, of the Lord. Is the Lord from heaven, uh, as uh, uh, as was the man of dust. Uh, so also are those who are made of dust. And as he is the heavenly man, so are uh, those who are heavenly. Uh, and we have uh, borne the image of the man of the dust. We shall also bear the image of the the heavenly man. Paul, Paul's basically saying that Jesus. Uh, resurrected body uh, was a prototype for our resurrection body. He, he takes us all the way back to the book of Genesis and, and he makes his point from there. He says that the first man ever created this uh, this man known as Adam in the book of Genesis was uh, was created uh, with a natural body that God uh, created out of the dust. Uh, uh, but the last Adam, and, and when we refer to last Adam in the New Testament terms, he's referring to Jesus Christ. He says this uh, this last Adam, uh, he became at his resurrection a spiritual body. Uh, so it's uh, through the first man, Adam, that we all human beings, we've all received this natural body that we live in now. But through the last man, Jesus, uh, we all will receive a spiritual body uh, like his in the resurrection. Since we've all been made out of this dust, we all carry in this present life the image of Adam. Uh, we're born in the image of Adam, but there will come a day uh, when we will bear the image of Christ at the resurrection, and uh, we'll uh, we'll have a heavenly body like His that's fit for heaven. We're uh, He says there's a logical order to this. You have to be a, a physical being first. You have to have a natural body first, and then you'll have the uh, the spiritual body later. Uh, but he says it will come and we will bear the image of Christ. We'll be like Christ in the, in the type of body we receive at the resurrection. Um, he writes in verses 50 through 52. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood, this physical body, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit uh, incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Paul, uh, Paul says people can't possibly live in heaven uh, before the glory of God eternally in these uh, fleshly, natural, mortal bodies. Scripture says no one can see God and, and live, uh, not, not in this uh, uh, corrupted mortal flesh that we live in now in, in order to uh, to stand uh, before the Lord, in order to, to live with God in heaven, we, we have to be changed. And Paul, uh, Paul says, I'm about to tell you a mystery. Now, in New Testament terms, uh, uh, a mystery is uh, always a truth that's been hidden from us uh, uh, that is now being revealed. It, it, this is a truth. And in this case, uh, uh, Paul's referring to the rapture. He's referring to the rapture of the church. Jesus hinted that there will be a day when uh, the rapture would come back in John 14, verse 1, uh, one through 3. And then uh, Paul gave us a, a lot of detail regarding the uh, the rapture in the book of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 4, uh, verse 13, I believe. Um, but here he reveals that mystery, the idea that there will be a rapture of the church, is that he's revealing that mystery, that truth to these uh, uh, these people who uh, live in Corinth. He's revealing it to the Corinthian church. He says there's going to come a day when the church, uh, the, the believers in Jesus Christ, both uh, those who are living at that time and those who are already dead, will instantly be called out of this world and called into eternity. No, no man, scripture tells us, knows the day or the hour when that's going to happen, but uh, we do know it's going to happen. Scripture's pretty clear on that. There will be a day when the church, the believers in Jesus Christ, will be instantly uh, called out of this world and, and called into eternity in heaven. Uh, Paul's telling us we don't know when that's going to happen, but he does say it's going to be very quick. 
it's going to happen quickly when it comes. It's, it's going to be like the twinkling of an eye that, that fast. And when that happens, he says, we're all going to be changed. We're all going to receive that glorified body we talk about. We're going to receive that resurrection body that Paul's been speaking of here. Even, even believers who are dead at that time are going to be raised from the dead. They're going to come out of the grave and they're going to meet Jesus in the air, we're, we're told in First Thessalonians. And in fact, Scripture tells us that the dead in Christ will be the first to be raised from the dead. Oh, when we die, I think Scripture is clear on this, when we die, our, our spirit, our soul goes immediately into the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. But the body, uh, when it dies, it, it sleeps, it rests in, in the ground, it rests uh, in, in a resting place. It's, 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 the body's dead, it's, it's asleep. But at the last trumpet, as uh, Paul speaks of here, uh, at the time of the rapture, at the time that the, uh, that Jesus comes and calls the church out of the world, all of the uh, the dead bodies will come out of the grave and, and they'll be changed into a spiritual body. They'll, they'll be changed into a glorified body, as we often call it. We'll be, we'll be changed into a, a body that's fit uh, to live for eternity in heaven. And, and when that happens, our, our souls that have been with Jesus will be reunited with these, uh, these new resurrected bodies and, and Jesus will take us into heaven. Our, 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 our new bodies, we're told here, will never perish. We'll, uh, we'll never die again. We'll never, uh, our bodies will never grow old, never, never decrease in, uh, in uh, 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 strength spiritually or, or physically. Is, is, is I'm looking forward to that body. I've been working pretty hard around the house here lately, and uh, I can tell you I'm a little bit tired, so I'm, I look forward to that day when I won't grow tired again. Um, Paul writes in verses 53 through 57, for this corruptible must put on incorruptible, and this mortal must put on immortality. Uh, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, uh, then shall be brought to, to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I think those are some of the most beautiful words written in Scripture. And I think sometimes it's a shame that uh, it seems the place we most often hear uh, those words are, are at funerals. I think that's true that we hear them there because they are comforting words and, and, and words that uh, we need to hear at a time when a loved one passes away. But uh, they really are beautiful words that we can um, respond to any time. It doesn't have to be just at the, the, death, of, the death of a loved one or a funeral. Uh, but Paul's uh, quoting here. He's quoting from the books of um, Isaiah and Hosea. Uh, in a kind of in sequence here, but uh, uh, he's saying well, we, when we die, we must put on immortality. We, we Christians, we, uh, we must wear and put on. He's talking about like putting on a garment. Uh, we must wear our resurrection body like a, a new set of clothes that God has designed especially for us. When, when that happens, he said, the Old Testament scriptures uh, that were written long ago will be fulfilled and death will be swallowed up in victory. Uh, in verse 56, he, uh, he explains that sin uh, that's been exposed to us by uh, the law of God uh, gives death its sting. So uh, uh, the strength of, of, of death's sting comes from the fact that we know about our sin through the law of God, but thanks be to God he says Jesus has provided this victory over death. Uh, Jesus' victory over death has, has taken away uh, the sting of death, the pain of death from us. Yes, we still die, but that death is not an eternal death. It's not a uh, con condemning death. Uh, death wasn't able to hold Jesus in the grave. and uh, uh, Jesus conquered death. Uh, he, he was raised from the dead by God. And because of that, Paul says, because of our faith in Jesus Christ, that God's going to raise us from the dead too. I think that's a wonderful truth. It's a hope for us as Christians. It's really the the, the basis of our faith. Uh, the uh, the motivation for our faith is knowing that one day we will be raised from the dead and we will spend eternity in heaven with Jesus Christ. Paul finishes this uh, this chapter with. Uh, 
verse 58, where he writes, Therefore, uh, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Paul says, therefore, he says, look back at what I've just told you. Look back at what I've just written to you. He says, since we know, uh, since we know that uh, one day we will all be raised from the dead uh, because we are the brethren, because we are brothers and sisters in Christ, because we are all uh, saved believers, we can be assured that one day we will be raised from the dead. Uh, but what should we be doing in the meantime? Well, what should we be doing now? Paul says, while you're waiting for that day of resurrection, remain steadfast, remain immovable. He's saying, uh, hang on to your faith. Uh, scripture uses the word endurance. Scripture uses the word perseverance. Uh, persevere in your faith. Hang on to your faith. Be immovable and steadfast no matter what trial comes, no matter uh, what uh, uh, potential suffering comes your way, no matter, uh, no matter what's going on, no matter what your circumstances are, uh, stand firmly in your faith. He says, uh, uh, as you're as you're waiting, let the the Lord work multiply. Let it abound in your life. Uh, nothing nothing that you can do for the Lord's sake. Nothing that you can ever do in the Lord's name is ever a work that's done in vain. As long as it's uh, um, true to the Word of God. As long as it's a work that's uh, uh, true to the to the scriptures and to the uh, to the gospel message. Uh, uh, that work that you do for the Lord is never a vain work. It's never a purposeless, useless, worthless work. It's always of value to our Lord and, and to uh, and to His saints and, and and to those who who need to hear His word. Um, and we're gonna we're gonna end this session for there uh, there for now. And uh, I think. Uh, God willing, next week we're going to come back and we're going to finish our study of 1 Corinthians. I, I think next time we can uh, cover chapter 16 in, in one session. But in that session, uh, Paul's going to teach us a lot. He's going to teach us uh, some about our giving within the church, uh, how, how we give. He's going to talk a little bit about our, our adversaries, uh, the, uh, the enemies of Christ. And then he's going to close this, uh, this, this letter, this epistle. Uh, with a, a wonderful burst, I would say, of exhortations for the uplifting, the building up of the church. And I, I look forward to uh, gathering with you next time and, and, and continuing and concluding this, uh, this study of 1 Corinthians. Uh, let's, let's close in prayer. Lord, we do thank you again for uh, uh, the wonderful teaching that you've been giving us here through, uh, uh, through the Apostle Paul. Uh, Lord, we look forward to that day when we'll receive our resurrection bodies, Lord, when we uh, uh, will meet Christ in the air. And uh, just what an exciting time that's going to be when the trumpet blows and our uh, our bodies are changed, Lord. And we uh, are raised into new life and we are ushered into heaven to, uh, to, to, to stay there with you, and with our, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we, uh, we look forward to that day. But in the meantime, or let us be uh, steadfast and immovable in our faith, and let, let us uh, let us be about your business, Lord, and let us be uh, abundant in your work, Lord, as we uh, uh, seek to uh, fulfill your will in our lives, Lord. Let us let us be reminded that the work that we do for your sake is uh, is not a work in vain, uh, Lord. We are grateful for all that you're doing and all that you have done and all that you will continue to do. In Jesus' name, Amen. Folks, I've enjoyed the, uh, uh, the session today, and I hope you'll join me again, uh, God willing, next week as we uh, conclude our study of 1 Corinthians. Until then, may uh, God hold you in the palm of his hand and uh, protect you and keep you. I'll, I'll see you soon.